It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I'll save the government the trouble of touting the $1.8 billion they state the Hydro One sale IPO made. Private investors jumped at this hot stock because it was a fire sale. You wouldn't see people rushing to buy the stock unless they thought they were getting a steal. A steal that will be on the backs of Ontario's families who can barely afford their energy bills as it is. The fire sale isn't going to pay for infrastructure. The infrastructure Order. budget of $130 billion was already funded in 2014. Yep. It's all spin. Distract the public by saying it's for infrastructure. Yep. In reality, it's to pay for scandal and waste. Right. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier is which one of your scandals is this fire sale intended to pay for? <laughs> e health gas, or which one is it? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, well, my understanding is that the Leader of the Opposition didn't think we were going to be able to realize the amount of money we need for infrastructure. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, there's too much money coming in. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that uh, you know we are very pleased that there was a successful IPO for uh, Hydro One that's generated almost $3 billion so far from that, uh, that wow. IPO, Mr. Speaker. That's a very good thing. I'm pleased to see that the IPO was well-received by markets and uh, it was well received, Mr. Speaker, because, because people see the value of the company, Mr. Speaker. What we know is that the benefits from this process will be many for the people of Ontario. The motivation, as the Leader of the Opposition knows quite well, is that we need to invest in infrastructure in this province if we are going to be globally competitive. There is no question about that, Mr. Speaker. And I will tell you, having been in China talking to companies and officials across the country, Mr. Speaker, I'm even more convinced that we need those investments. Thank you. I find both sides uh, disruptive enough so that uh, I'll try to get uh, two questions and answers properly. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, broadening ownership, leveraging assets, necessary investments, these are all buzzwords that Liberal ministers have been reading from their talking points. Let's call a spade a spade. It's a wrong-headed, desperate fire sale. What the people of Ontario really want is the government to protect an asset for future generations that has built this great province since 1908. People are tired of playing the government's shell games that only helps the government's books look better for two years. The government should look beyond the next election and listen to the financial accountability officer. Former Premier Ernie Eves looked at this and walked away, realizing it hurt the province's long-term future. Mr. Speaker, where will the Premier do the right thing, Order. walk away, and protect this important asset for Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, if we're going to go back to uh, the previous government's record, we'll start with the 407, Mr. Let's Speaker. Start. That's where we'll start, because that was the fire sale of all fire sales, Mr. Speaker. And we learned from all the mistakes that were made by that uh, that government, Mr. Speaker. So I talked about I talked about the investments in infrastructure that are critical. Let me talk about some of the other benefits that will flow from this, Mr. Speaker. What this will do is it will allow for increased investments in those infrastructure uh, in Initiatives without further raising taxes, without increasing debt, Mr. Speaker, or without recklessly cutting public services. This will be a better run company, Mr. Speaker, and we haven't talked, I think, enough about that. The fact is that uh, Hydro One needs to be an improved company, Mr. Speaker. There are many, many changes that need to take place in that. Uh, uh, in that company, that will happen with stronger yes, management, Mr. Speaker, and with a company committed to cu customer service and performance. Thank you. I will fin finish in the third. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, you need to get out of the Queen's Park bubble and listen to what Ontarians are saying. I, I was at a rally. I was at a rally in Mississauga on the weekend of hardworking Ontarians about the fire sale. Oh, I've got a quip for you, but I'm just going to pass. Finish, please. 
Mr. Speaker, this isn't a joke. I was at a rally in Mississauga on the weekend, and thousands <laughs> of residents were concerned about this fire sale. Rallies like this are springing up all over Ontario. Leadership is understanding if you've made a mistake to correct course, not proceed stubbornly despite evidence suggesting it's wrong. Why does this government have a financial accountability officer if you're not going to listen? Why do you say you value municipalities if you don't take note of their resolutions? The government has sold 15 percent. You still have time to do the right Question. thing. You still have time to keep majority. Will you do the right thing? Thank you. Bring her. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just talk about outside the Queen's Park bubble. Outside the Queen's Park bubble, where I have been for a number of days, Mr. Speaker, people are looking at us and saying, are you going to build infrastructure? If I bring my company from China to Ontario, am I going to be able to... The member from Dufferin Caledon and the member from Leeds Grenville come to order. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Government House Leader, come to order. Member from Renfrew, come to order. Carry on. When I talk to companies in China who want to expand or bring business into Ontario, Mr. Speaker, they want to know that they're going to be able to move their goods across the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. They want to know, Mr. Speaker, that we are committed to making the investments that are going to allow them to thrive. So that's what's going on outside the Queen's Park bubble, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that if we are going to compete in a global economy, if we are going to be able to compete with jurisdictions that that's are her. investing in infrastructure, that are building, Mr. Speaker, then we have to do the same. That's why we're made, we've made this decision, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Hydro One fire sale is causing Ontarians to be concerned for a number of reasons. One of those is these gold-plated paychecks handed out to the Hydro One executive still don't make sense. And I've tried asking about this before, and I didn't get an answer. Last year, the 61 highest-paid CEOs and presidents in the province made a combined $24 million. That's how much the Liberals are giving just the top four people at Hydro One. The compensation doesn't make sense, and people in Ontario want an explanation. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier take responsibility to rein in this executive compensation that doesn't make sense to anyone in Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, you know, I hope that when the, uh, when the Leader of, of the Opposition is having these conversations with uh, people in Ontario, he's talking to them about a number of other things. I hope he's also talking to them about the infrastructure investments that their municipalities are looking for. That's the first thing. I hope he's also talking about the fact that Ontario remains will Remember remain from the Renfrew, largest second time. single shareholder in uh, Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, with 40 per cent of the company, Mr. Speaker, and that so taxpayers will benefit from an improved company. I hope that he makes it clear to the people of Ontario that that improved company, that stronger management, that focus on performance, that a company that it will grow and will be a better company will actually benefit the people of Ontario. I hope he knows yes, those, uh, those realities, those facts, as he has a conversation with the people of Ontario, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and in terms of this being for infrastructure, your infrastructure budget hasn't changed. It's still $130 billion. It's not about infrastructure. The CEO of Cancer Care Ontario makes just over $500,000. The Royal Conservatory of Music, $450,000 for their CEO. Colleges of Ontario and the Canadian National Institute of the Blind, their CEOs, make $330,000. Hydro One CEO, you think it's appropriate for them to make $4 million. It doesn't add up. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier believe Hydro One executives deserve so much more than these other organizations that, that are doing so much to create prosperity in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the question from the opposition isn't sincere, only because they themselves have for long tried to propose the dismantling of Hydro, Ontario Hydro, to what it became. We have now taken the necessary steps to secure the value of Hydro One, a component of that overall 
conglomerate that they destroyed. We have we now did the necessary steps to provide value. We have now done the first IPO, which has generated a net of $3 billion for the people of Ontario. Its valuation has now improved as a result. We've taken that and we're reinvesting into the province by creating new assets. Unlike the member opposite that want to recklessly sell everything off 100% or provide massive That's cuts right. across Ontario. We're not doing that. We've established a much better run company as a result of the action that we've taken, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, a $4 million salary. The government knows how much money other provincial hydro executives make. They know how much Deputy more House money Leader. chief executives in this province make. They know Ontario hydro rates are among the highest in North America. The government knows. They've been getting calls at their constituency offices just like everyone the legislature has. Ontarians shouldn't be put in a position to choose between heating their home and paying their energy bills. Yet the Premier continues to dance around justifying these gold-plated paychecks to Hydro One executives. Mr. Speaker, I've asked numerous times, does the Premier think it's appropriate to pay the Hydro One CEO $4 million? And if you can't justify it, can any one of your ministers justify it? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister? The question is, was it appropriate for us to restructure Hydro One? Yes. Was it effective for us to take the necessary steps to increase its value? Absolutely. Is it effective that we reinvest those net gains, $3 billion in net gains from this first trot into our, into our economy? Absolutely. The member opposite knows that. The member opposite couldn't do that. In fact, what they're suggesting Finish, please. We have definitely put new leadership at Hydro One. We have taken the necessary steps to provide a new board and a new executive, and as a result, we've increased its valuation and improved the values that Ontarians still have, which is 84% of Hydro One. That company is worth more today than it was last yes, week because of the steps we've taken, and, Mr. Speaker, will continue to provide Thank greater you. value as we reinvest those funds. Thank you. Any questions? The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ed Clark told the Premier to sell off Hydro One. So even though 185 municipalities want to keep Hydro public, businesses are worried about rates, First Nations weren't consulted, and eight in ten families want to keep Hydro One public, the Premier is selling off Hydro One. She's listening to her unelected banker instead of Ontario families. Last week, Ed Clark talked hospitals, universities, and colleges and said he wanted to, quote, link them more closely to the private sector and turn them into exporters. Can the Premier tell Ontarians, is this liberal code for saying she's going to be privatizing and selling off health and education services in Ontario, Speaker? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, um, it's, it's quite clear that the leader of the third party and, quite frankly, the, uh, the leader of the opposition uh, are not interested in the investments in infrastructure that we know we need to make. They're, they've been quite clear about that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the leader of the third party, uh, I think, has issues with um, creating partnerships outside of our borders, because that's really what uh, Ed Clark was talking about. And I would say to the leader of the third party, you know, we have to developed huge expertise in health and education within Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as, as the uh, member knows, I was recently in China, I just got back, and I want, to, I want to talk to her about two examples of how we can use that expertise to create partnerships that can benefit people within Ontario yes, and outside of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and I'll give her those examples in my supplementary. Thank you. Speaker, Ontarians expect their Premier to set priorities and show judgment. The Premier wasn't elected on a plan to sell Hydro One, and here we are. She's putting Mike Harris to shame with her Hydro One sell-off. And the same unelected banker, Speaker, who wrote the plan to sell Hydro One, has now been given carte blanche by this Premier. The Premier can't seem to say no to her unelected banker, and he has opened the door now to privatization in our public 
public hospitals, hospitals that have already suffered Speaker, years of cuts and bed closures under this Liberal government. Will this Premier tell Ed Clark to back off our universal public health care system? So let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party is saying she stands in opposition to partnerships outside with, with, with entities outside of Ontario in the education and health sector. So, Mr. Speaker, she would stand in opposition to the two uh, agreements that I'm going to talk about now. These are, these are agreements, Mr. Speaker, make note, that create jobs, that actually spur investment, and they, they foster innovation in our province. So, the first one is uh, between the TV Ontario and CBS Consulting Inc. of Markham. They're entering into an agreement to provide English language high school courses to Chinese students. That's an investment of $250,000, which will create four jobs. It's a small agreement, Mr. Speaker, but it takes expertise that has been developed here and allows people outside of Ontario to benefit. The second one is an, an agreement between Sick Kids Hospital and Children's Hospital of Fudan University, and I'll go into the details in the supplement. Speaker, earlier this month, the Minister of Health gave a speech that mentioned transformation no less than 18 times. Now, Ontarians are learning that the man who's driving those changes will be the same unelected banker that was behind the sell-off of Hydro One. Ed Clark says we need to link our hospitals, quote, more closely to the private sector and, quote, turn them into exporters. Why is this premier opening the door to privatization in health care? Thank you. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me, let me again, I will just talk about this agreement between Sick Kids and Children's Hospital of Fudan University, because this is what we're talking about, Mr. Speaker. This memorandum of understanding will initiate a multi-year partnership to support neo, uh, neonatology through, first, advisory services to support the design, quality, improvement, and workflow of a new CHFU neonatal tower. Secondly, the development of education and training programs for physicians, nurses, and management to be delivered in both China and Canada, and thirdly, the possible coordination of joint academic conferences and joint research projects. That's Mr. Cool. Speaker, this will save Chinese babies' lives. Yeah. This will make the quality of health care better in China. The leader of the third party is standing in opposition to that kind of improvement. It's shameful, Mr. Speaker. We live in the world, and she should That's get on board. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, Canadian Ontario funded health care professionals and institutions should be providing health care to the people of Ontario, which they cannot get under this Liberal government. That's where our focus should be. So speaking of privatization, Speaker, I have a very basic question for this Premier. Will the Premier rule out the selling off of more revenue generating assets here in Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, you know, the way I see our innovation and our capacity in Ontario is that, of course, it is first and foremost to benefit the people of this province. But, Mr. Speaker, we live in the world. We live in a globe that has a need for the innovation that starts here. Mr. Speaker, I just came back from Beijing with our Minister of Economic Development and uh, the Minister of, uh, of International Trade, Mr. Speaker, and in Beijing, it is very hard to breathe, Mr. Speaker. The air is so polluted that it's clear that there needs to be a change in those cities. The, the government officials know it, Mr. Speaker. Well, I can tell you, we have technology here in Ontario that we can Order. bring to the world, that we can share, Mr. Speaker, innovation Answer. that can benefit the people who live in those cities. Mr. Speaker, surely, surely the leader of the third party thinks Thank that you. that's a good thing for us yeah. to do. Yeah. You see it, please? Thank you. Speaker, I asked the Premier about her intentions to sell off more revenue generating assets. I don't think she heard me. The Minister of Finance has refused to rule out selling off more revenue generating assets. The President of Tre uh, Treasury Board has refused to rule out selling off more revenue generating assets. My finance critic has written to the Minister and has had no response, Speaker. Now, I have written to the Premier. The Premier can clear this up, Speaker, with, one, uh, with a one 
one-word simple answer. Will the Premier tell Ontarians whether or not more revenue-generating assets are going on the auction block? Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that what we intended to do was written in our budget. We talked about real estate assets, Mr. Speaker. We said that we were going to ask Ed Clark to look at the assets owned by the people of Ontario. He has done that, Mr. Speaker. He has given us advice. Will we continue to work to, uh, to share our technology and our expertise, whether it's in education, whether it's in clean tech, whether it's in health care? Will we work to continue to share that with the world? Will Will we develop partnerships and will we help companies in Ontario to expand and export across the world, whether it's in agri-food or whether it's in energy? Yes, Mr. Speaker, we will do that because the expertise that is grown here in Ontario is second to none. We're proud of it. We are going to shop it to the world, Mr. Speaker, so that we can improve the lives of not just people in Ontario, but people around the world. Speaker, this Liberal government has no mandate to sell off Hydro One. No mandate whatsoever. They did not, no matter what this Premier says, they did not tell Ontarians that that was their intention during the last election campaign. Now they're leaving the door open, Speaker, to selling off even more. To every Ontarian, you deserve a government a government that is honest with you about what their intentions are. Will this Premier do the right thing, be honest with the people of Ontario, and tell them here and now in this Legislature which revenue-generating generating assets of are on the auction block now? So, well, Mr. Speaker, it was so clear in our budget that even the leader of the third party got it. Here's what she said just days after the last election, and I quote, The budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, unquote. That's what the leader of the third party said. Mr. Speaker, it was clear that we were looking at assets and leveraging those assets in order to be able to invest in the infrastructure that we need know we need for the 21st century. Now, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party can look right in the camera and she can talk solely about Hydro One. What she's not talking about is that in those same municipalities, in every one of those communities, there are needs. There are needs for roads. There are needs for bridges. There are needs for upgraded water systems. Yes, There's need for transit. She's not talking about that, Mr. Speaker, because she has no Order. way of funding that investment. We are. We're, we're building you see it, please? You see it, please? New question. The member from Chatham Kent Essex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. After serious questions were raised about the safety of the province's new Toronto South Detention Centre, a memo on confidentiality was issued to all staff from the facility's director advising staff to keep quiet or possibly risk losing their jobs. The memo warns that the disclosure of any information may, and I quote, damage the reputation of the ministry, unquote. It's clear that the government is more concerned with protecting its image than protecting correctional officers and inmates. Oh. This memo is an insult to the men and women who risk their lives day in and day out in dangerous conditions. They have tried to go through the proper channels and were ignored. When they spoke out to an opposition critic, the government tried to silence them. Question. Speaker, why is the minister trying to muzzle correctional officers who are only speaking out to protect public safety? Can you say that, please? Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, we very much uh, cherish and appreciate the work that our correctional officers and probation and parole officers do uh, in our institutions and across Ontario every single day. Speaker, their health and safety is a number one priority for myself and our ministry. And we're working along with them, Speaker. And I invite the member opposite from both parties to work with us as we. 
uh, transform our correctional system to ensure uh, that we really focus on individuals oh, and we yeah. break the cycle of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, criminality uh, that exists in our system. And Speaker, Toronto South Detention Centre plays a very important role as a newer institution in that transformation because it contains innovative programming speaker and healthcare services that improves uh, our uh, uh, capability to rehabilitate uh, offenders and to sir. make sure that they are better reintegrated in the community. I look forward to speaking to some of those unique features more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, we may know why the ministry wants to strong arm its correctional officers into staying quiet. Tell Just us. over a week ago, five scathing reports were released about detention centers across the province. The findings range from concerning to horrific. The common issues were a chronic amount of understaffing, which in turn led to an overuse of lockdowns, which is inhumane and makes inmates more hostile leading to more staffing challenges and more lockdowns. The troubling reports were given to the government in March, but publicly released, Mr. Speaker, in November. So, Mr. Speaker, what steps has the minister taken in those months to address the crisis in corrections? Well, Speaker, I'm glad that the member opposite spoke about the reports that we made available to public that was uh, that was developed by uh, the community wow. advisory boards. It was Speaker, this government, uh, under the previous minister's leadership, the current attorney general, that we created those community advisory boards so that we can create a link between our communities and our institutions. And then we gave those members of community advisory boards access to our institutions so they can give us community's perspective as to how we can improve the conditions in our, in our detention centers and transform those detention centers. Speaker, that is why our government took the step of making those reports available publicly so that there is more guidance for us to work together in transforming our system. Speaker, it shows our commitment and devotion to ensure that our correctional system is not just a warehousing model Answer. of incarceration, but actually focuses on individuals Member so that they Chad, can, better, they can better rehabilitate and reintegrate in our community because, Speaker, we all succeed when those inmates are properly reintegrated in our community. Thank you. Your question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. On Thursday, the government issued a press release saying it was getting $2.2 billion from the Hydro One sale in a special tax benefit. But during estimates, I asked about that $2.2 billion, and senior public servants said the $2.2 billion isn't cash. It's not money that can be spent. It's just an accounting entry. Can the Premier explain how, how she can spend $2.2 billion on subways when that $2.2 billion isn't in anyone's bank account and doesn't exist as cash? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member opposite uh, references the uh, deferred tax benefit that has accrued to the province as a result of this first 50 per cent share of the tranche of the IPO, uh, of which uh, is going to be dedicated to the Trillium Trust. A billion-dollar dividend was also uh, established just prior to the IPO, again also going to uh, the Trillium Trust, all of which is being used to support the uh, uh, the renovations and the investments that we're making in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I, I take non-answer as acknowledgement that there isn't real cash. The Hydro One sale gets worse every time you look at it. Ontarians are losing control of an important asset. The non-partisan financial accountability officer says the deal will leave Ontario worse off than it is today. We always said that the Premier's Hydro One sell-off with smoke and mirrors, what we didn't recognize, didn't know, was how much smoke would be generated, because now they're counting cash that doesn't exist. Will the Premier admit that the $2.2 billion her government claimed would go to transit doesn't actually exist as cash, and explain how much of the transit plan is based on this kind of bad math? 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, the net result of Hydro One activity is actually a consolidated number that comes into our into the Treasury, of which $2.2 billion now is being reallocated for deferred tax benefit, and it's being reinvested and dedicated to the Children's Trust. As well, Mr. Speaker, an additional billion dollars is being used to pay down debt which is why we're doing the transaction to not only have capital gains to be reinvested into new products, new assets, but it's also to pay down substantive debt, which is, in this case, a billion dollars with this transaction. So, Mr. Speaker, it is enabling us to increase the valuation of Hydro One, enabling us now to have a much better, more efficient, revigorated operation, which provides greater value to the shareholders, of which is the Ontario uh, public, Mr. Speaker, and that will enable us now to continue fostering greater returns and being reinvested. The FAO noted that very issue and noted that he was not evaluating the after. Thank you. New question. The member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I know our government has made uh, strides in our plan to build Ontario up. In my riding of Newmarket Aurora, my constituents have noticed our government's progress. In fact, uh, earlier today, I was at uh, the premier uh, cookie manufacturer in Ontario, Cookie It Up, to make an announcement or to help with an announcement about uh, growth there. We've made progress in creating an innovative and dynamic business environment, building modern public infrastructure such as roads, bridges and transit, investing in the people of Ontario in their skills and talents, and finally, we've taken leadership in strengthening retirement income security. The minister's last update was in the 2015 budget, which was tabled in the spring of last year. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance tell this House when he will be providing us with the latest update on our province's progress. Question, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the member from Newmarket Aurora for the question. And as the member has said, our government prepared and delivered details in the 2015 budget to achieve a strong economic and fiscal plan. And I'm happy to announce today that we will provide an update to this plan. It will take place on Thursday, November 26, in this very House, when we table the 2015 Fall Economic Statement. The 2015 Fall Economic Statement will not only provide an update on the economic and fiscal situation of the province, but we will also report back on the progress we've made toward ensuring greater prosperity for all Ontarians. And I'd like to thank the member for the question, and I look forward to tabling the 2015 Fall Economic Statement on November 26. Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd uh, like to thank the minister for that answer. I know I'm speaking on behalf of uh, members when I say we're very excited to hear the progress our government has made on our plans to improve here, here. everyday lives of Ontarians. I know the fall economic statement generally provides an update on the province's finances. However, I understand that this statement in particular will be focused on our progress. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please provide further details of what we can expect to hear about uh, 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 hear about uh, in the fall economic statement. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. The fall economic statement will provide an update on the progress of our plan, including fostering an innovative business climate, strengthening income security, building critical public infrastructure, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, providing investments made to the people of Ontario. Ontarians' talents and skills. This is a time of fundamental change, and our government is not only embracing that change, we're driving it. And the fall economic statement presented November 26 will provide an opportunity to report back on the actions that we've taken and where we will continue to achieve and go for more success for the great people of our great province. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Lampton, Kent Middlesex. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, my question this morning is to the Premier. As the Premier knows, over half a million people in the province of Ontario are currently unemployed and looking for work. This government's high tax and high debt policies are literally chasing jobs out of Ontario. Two weeks ago, I wrote to urge the Premier to join her colleague, the Minister of the Environment, and affirm her support for the proposed Billy Bishop runway extension. Mr. Speaker, why hasn't the Premier responded to my letter, and more importantly, why hasn't she stood up for the 2,000 well-paying jobs that this important proposal would create? Minister, Minister of Transportation. 
Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Speaker. Of course, I thank the member opposite uh, for this question. I think that he would know. I think every member in this House would know that the uh, the matter that's uh, being discussed in the question is actually an issue that's the responsibility uh, to work through or work out between the federal government, the City of Toronto, and the Toronto Port Authority, Speaker. But of course, this gives me a wonderful opportunity to talk about how important it is that our government continue to proceed with our very ambitious plan to not only build the province up, but to support the City of Toronto, Speaker. Order. Since 2003, Speaker, this government has invested billions of dollars in crucial infrastructure to support the City of Toronto, Speaker. Uh, we have a number of projects that this member, I believe, would know are currently underway. For example, Speaker, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Just a few weeks ago, Answer. we awarded a 30-year contract to Crosslinks Transit Solutions, Speaker, to build that transformational transit project. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and back to the Premier. In 2013, the Minister of Transportation at that time, the Honourable Glenn Murray, said, and I quote, I don't think we ever want to forget what an important economic asset that is and how important that airline is to growing jobs in central Toronto and support for our film and banking industries, and that the airport is critical to our economy and it's been a positive addition to the economy, unquote. Mr. Speaker, the proposal to extend the runway would create 2,000 well-paying jobs and over $250 million in annual economic impact. These jobs would help support the Bombardier Downsview plant in Toronto, which recently announced layoffs of 500 people. Oh. Speaker, the Premier is failing Ontario's workers by not advocating for this important project, but there is still time. We need a willing federal partner. Will, Will the Premier commit question? today to calling her friend, Prime Minister Trudeau, and urging him to support this important proposal? No, you don't have the mic. Now you do. Speaker Barry, thanks very much. I, obviously quite ironic that this member and from that particular party would talk about having willing federal partners, Speaker. It's also, Speaker, it's also interesting to me. It's also interesting to me, Speaker, that that member from that caucus talks about 2012 or 2013, Speaker. In my time in this legislature, since 2012, year after year, and before that point in time, Speaker, members on that in that caucus from that party have consistently voted against budgets from this government, Speaker, that included funding to support all of the great things that member is talking about with respect to infrastructure, with respect to creating jobs, Speaker. And I can't understand why that member would stand and ask this question when they voted against the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. They voted against funding for Go RER. They voted against funding for the Union Pearson Express. They voted against funding for Toronto's new streetcar, Speaker. Answer. Again, the irony is a little bit thick in here today, but the people of this province and the city understand exactly where this Premier and our government stand. Thanks very much. Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2009 and 2010, the government, including the current Premier, voted to support the first two of my five bills to allow municipalities to pass inclusionary zoning bylaws. And yet, when the government released its long-term affordable housing strategy in late 2010, inclusionary zoning was nowhere to be found. Last year, the government voted to support a bill by the Liberal member from Etobicoke Lakeshore, which also would allow for inclusionary zoning. As yet, when the government tabled Bill 73 to amend the Planning Act, again, inclusionary zoning was nowhere to be found. After six years, why hasn't the Premier followed through on her government's repeated pledges to support inclusionary zoning? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The Minister of Municipal well, Affairs and Housing. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by uh, thanking the member from Park View High Park. She's uh, Parkdale High Park. She's been a uh, relentless uh, advocate uh, on a number of files uh, related to social housing and inclusive zoning. Uh, I've had several conversations, uh, good conversations, uh, with her as well as the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore on inclusive zoning. And uh, I just want uh, uh, the member opposite uh, 
to know that uh, we believe it's important that we have a strong housing uh, uh, platform. We're working on it. We're doing a long-term housing strategy. And uh, should we uh, decide to employ inclusive zoning, and we're looking at it very Answer. seriously, as the member knows, uh, it would be part of that strategy. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Again, to the Premier, uh, three times over the last six years, the Liberal government has voted in this House in support of inclusionary zoning. The chief city planner of Toronto says Toronto would have an extra 12,000 affordable housing units today if the city had been allowed to pass an inclusionary zoning bylaw five years ago. Instead, the wait list for affordable housing is now at a record high, with over 168,000 Ontario households. This is a crisis. How much longer will the Premier force Ontarians to wait before she finally honours her government's repeated pledges to support inclusionary zoning? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I suspect, Mr. Speaker, not much longer. Um, and let me let me just uh, let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that we continue to meet with municipalities, uh, primary stakeholders who have a number of uh, issues and concerns which we're walking through, and also other stakeholders, because if you want to do something like this, uh, particularly if the goal is to house people who need housing you want to do it right. Yeah, so absolutely. should we do it, and I anticipate, uh, knowing that we're looking at it uh, very carefully and strategically, uh, when, if and when we do it, we'll do it right. Thank you. Your question, the member from Scarborough Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. On Saturday evening, the Minister, the member from Trinity Spadina, and I returned from a trade mission to China with the Premier. During this trip, we were able to secure several trade agreements. My constituents in Scarborough Asian Court are well aware of the vital role that trade plays in the Ontario economy. China is Ontario's and Canada's second largest trading partners in the world, and our long-standing productive relationship with China has generated trade, jobs and economic gen uh, growth for both regions. In 2014, the two-way trade totaled almost $40 billion. As such, I'm proud of our government that has targeted strategic connections abroad to continue to add jobs to this province. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please provide an update Question. on the trade deals that we secured during the second trade mission to China? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Scarborough Agent for that question, but more so for her valuable contribution and that of the member from Trinity Spadina to the success over all of our trip. Very pleased, Mr. Speaker, to announce in this legislature that the Premier's mission to China secured over $2.5 billion in agreements, which will net this province 1,700 jobs in over 100 agreements overall. For example, Mr. Speaker, just in the last day in Beijing, we were able to secure three trade agreements between Wing on New Group Canada and JD.com, China Telecom Group, and cross-border wholesale. This agreement alone totaled $230 million. It's important to note that these companies could have signed agreements with companies and jurisdictions anywhere in the world, but Mr. Answer. Speaker, they chose Ontario, and we're proud of that, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for their uh, very important response. Ontario's economy must stay competitive in the face of challenging global economic conditions. We can only to do this attracting targeted strategic deals, which are suitable for our highly skilled workforce. One such agreement is a hydrogenics at Mississauga Company, which will produce fuel cell technology for zero emission uh, public transport buses. Another example is a product uh, tech Inc., a Scarborough company that developed a cost-effective 3D foot scanner, pressure mapping algorithm 
for diabetic feet and paramedic shoes design software in a matter of minutes. And I'm proud, Mr. Speaker, of our government open uh, ventures for smart, forward thinking, environmental friendly Question. companies. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please provide an update to the House on other agreements that we reach in China? Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me uh, share a few more examples of some of the important agreements reached uh, on the Premier's mission to China. We helped secure an $80 million agreement with China Telecom Group uh, to import food and Canadian nutritional pro products to China. Cross-border City America Wholesale will purchase $50 million in Canadian produce over the next three years and open 30 new stores in 2016. City Capital announced a $100 million investment toward Paradise, a new attraction and residential development that I know will be very welcome in Niagara Falls. Uh, Shenzhen Bowser Investment Group acquired 80 per cent share of EDI, a Toronto-based leader in the field of robotics automation. With this acquisition, Shenzhen Bowser intends to create an additional yes, 200 jobs in Ontario. This Premier and this government are determined to open up Ontario's economy to the global economy. Thank you. This recent mission will do— Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, last week was Family Doctors Week, and many family doctors uh, are quite concerned about patients' access to timely health care services. Over 800,000 Ontarians are currently without a family doctor, and these patients are unable to have their health care needs met appropriately. Ontario is blessed with dedicated and selfless family doctors, but they are facing an uphill battle. The resources are tapped, and they face a growing burden of an aging population requiring complex care, while an additional 140,000 patients enter the health care system each year. As a result, less than half of Ontarians are able to see their primary care provider within 24 hours of getting sick. Minister, family doctors are wondering why the government's response has been to cut $800 million from physician services, stop, stop collaborating with OMA, and as Order. reported by the media, threaten to cut doctors' pay. Mr. Speaker, Question. will the minister explain why he targets and blames doctors for his government's failings? Thank you, well, thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud of the work that our frontline health care workers, including her doctors, are doing. But I have to correct the member opposite. Uh, we have been discussing with the OMA on a regular basis. I met with the president uh, just a few weeks ago as well. Uh, we're prepared to uh, re-enter discussions uh, leading towards an agreement at any time. It's the OMA that, in fact, has refused to come back to the table to continue those negotiations. But I remain optimistic. I remain optimistic, Mr. Speaker, because the uh, OMA did agree to uh, co-establish with us a table that that looks at the future of physician services yeah. in this province, Fantastic. Mr. Speaker, to look at issues of compensation, to look at human resource issues, to look at issues, important issues like what H uh, uh, Health Quality Ontario released in the report last week in terms of wait times for Ontarians. The sorts of issues which will give confidence to our physicians that we are working together in partnership for a sustainable yes, health care system. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, the relationship between doctors and the government is at an all-time low. This government has twice imposed fee reductions and limited options for practicing family doctors. Patients are the ones who are suffering. To build a sustainable health care system, this government must collaborate with frontline health care workers. Instead, we see this government scold doctors in the media, cut resources for patient care, and chase away medical residents and students to other jurisdictions. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain to me how blaming and penalizing doctors is helpful to patient yeah, yeah. care? Thank you. Yes, well, Mr. Speaker, I quite frankly don't know where to begin. There's so many Stunning. problems with uh, what the member opposite Stunning. has just uh, presented here. First of all, in terms of his allegation of cuts, we're increasing the uh, budget that goes specifically to physician compensation by 1.25% last year, this year, and next year as well. There are no cuts. In fact, we're increasing, and we're increasing to accommodate the changes in demographics and the growth in our population, Mr. Speaker. But I want to remain optimistic. I've reached out to the OMA, despite what the member opposite and his position might be in the position of the opposition party. I've reached out to the OMA. I want to engage them. We're already we're always open to continue discussions and negotiations despite a year of negotiations. The OMA at this moment in time has refrained from restarting those discussions with us, but I'm optimistic Answer. that those discussions will one day bear fruit. Here. Thank you. Your question, member from Oslo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
People in my riding of Oshawa depend on the region's auto industry. For many families across Ontario, including those in Windsor, London, St. Thomas, Hamilton, Kitchener, St. Catharines, and Oshawa, it provides them with a stable paycheck month after month. Last week, the Premier's privatization czar, Ed Clark, stood up in Toronto and said that the hard-working people of Ontario's manufacturing sector have seen what amounts to a quarter of their paycheck cut under Liberal government. He even said that, quote, low labour costs are part of Mexico's winning formula, end quote. It's evident that his definition of a, quote, new day in manufacturing means leaving people behind and lower paying manufacturing jobs. That is not what the people of Oshawa or Ontario need or deserve. Will the Premier Question. commit to standing up for the hardworking people in the province's manufacturing sector? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure is going to want to speak to this, but let me say off the top, that is exactly what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. Our strategy has been all along to invest in, to support, to work with the auto sector and the manufacturing sector writ large, Mr. Speaker, to, to allow it to become the advanced manufacturing sector that will allow us to compete. That's why we've been making investments. That's why we have set up the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, Mr. Speaker, the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have been making the, these investments to allow the manu manufacturing sector to go through this transformation. We're not giving up on the auto sector, Mr. Speaker. We're not giving up on manufacturing. We have expertise in Ontario that is wanted all over the world. We are going to make sure that we have a modern, a modern manufacturing sector in this province, and it will include Answer. auto, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. The people in my community of Oshawa are all too familiar with the inaction of consecutive Liberal governments. They have sat on the sidelines while more than 300,000 manufacturing jobs have disappeared in this province. And the latest numbers from StatsCan shows, show that Ontario saw the largest decline in manufacturing sales in September. So what is Ed Clark's answer? Cut job security, slash regulations that protect our workers, our environment, and the quality of our products. Will the Premier commit to creating an auto strategy that leaves no one behind and creates good, paying, stable jobs? Thank you. Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I, I've just spent the 19 days of my life out in Japan and China That's talking about the competitiveness of Ontario's auto sector. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, in today's economy, we've attracted $4.5 billion in 12 months alone to Ontario's auto sector, including significant investments from GM. Who are investing, Mr. Speaker, with a hundred new engineers in their in their innovation center in GM. So we're building the auto sector in today's economy. But, Mr. Speaker, we also want a healthy auto sector in tomorrow's economy that is just around a corner. And that's why we're investing in innovation. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we need to be a leader in connected vehicles, a leader in artificial intelligence, a leader in sensors. Mr. Speaker, we Answer. are, we will continue to be, so we can build the auto sector. The jobs of today and tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, even if Thank the you. NDP want to live in the past. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa, all the way. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le ministre de la Formation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. It is imperative that our colleges, with help from our government, provide students with the necessary skills and training they need to succeed in today's competitive labour market. It is equally important that colleges continue to be responsive to the different economic and demographic changes that are taking shape in our province. Minister, I understand that our government, in collaborating in new ways uh, with our college partners to support seniors in Ontario. Speaker, for you to the minister, can you please inform the members of the House on how colleges are preparing students to meet the emerging labour market needs in seniors' communities across the province? Thank you, Minister of Training, College, Universities, Research and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to say merci beaucoup to the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to supporting a high-quality post-secondary education for Ontarians. Ontario's colleges currently offer a range of specialized programs that serve to fill local labour market needs and to prepare our students for the jobs of tomorrow. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, my ministry recently approved a new retirement communities management graduate certificate program at Algonquin College. This program, Mr. Speaker, is a strong example of how Ontario colleges are working with their communities and creating innovative programs to meet these emerging needs. With over 2 million seniors in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this program will enable students to learn and apply management skills in retirement communities across the province of Ontario. Our government, Mr. Speaker, will continue Thanks, to sir. support our colleges in developing new and innovative programs that will make the lives of Ontarians better. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Merci, Monsieur le Président, and I'd like to applaud the Minister for Thank you, Mr. Speaker. investing in a strong and qualified labour force that is responsive to the local needs of communities in Ontario, particularly in my riding of Ottawa, Lea, where there is a significant ageing population. Speaker, the Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs recently announced the launch of a new graduate program in retirement communities management in Ottawa. I had the pleasure Mr. Speaker, of working in the retirement sector for 15 years and as a former co-owner of a retirement residence in one of the largest and fastest growing regions in Ontario with a demand for larger and new retirement residences, this innovative program will be particularly important to me. There are numerous challenges and opportunities surrounding safety, health and inclusion that accompany retirement community management and require specific skills. Mr. Speaker, Question. can the Minister please inform this House on how working together with colleges to introduce programs like these will help provide the best Thank care you. and support for seniors in Ontario? Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you very much, Speaker. I was delighted to be in Ottawa for the official launch of the uh, new graduate program, as a matter of fact, Speaker. As Minister, I recognize the uh, dynamic opportunity to work with Ontario colleges to support seniors in new and innovative ways. Our government, Speaker, supports this program and uh, supports uh, prospective students, Speaker, planning to pursue careers in management of retirement communities and improve the lives of Ontario seniors at the same time. This new program is spe specifically designed, Speaker, to align with the Ontario Retirement Home Act, legislation our government created to regulate care and safety standards for seniors in retirement homes. Speaker, Ontario's booming senior population has spurred an excep exceptionally high employment Answer. demand for qualified management professionals in this industry. We continue to support this initiative by Ontario colleges, investment, and support in what they are doing for the seniors in Ontario. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Nicholson. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. There's a sense of chaos and uncertainty at home due to job cuts and work stoppages at major provincial employers. I've spoken about the 350 frontline health care workers, including more than 100 nurses, this government has fired at our hospital. But now the government has also fired 54 workers at Nipissing University, including 22 professors. So now the student, the uh, Nipissing University students, have been without classes for two weeks as a faculty strike uh, wears on. But this government has also fired 43 workers at Ontario Northland, and now they're in a lockout. These provincial actions are hurting Nipissing families, students, seniors, and businesses. Question. My question is, what is the government doing to resolve these disputes? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for the question. I think the government of Ontario, I think, is very proud of the record of labour peace that we've enjoyed in the province of Ontario when you compare it to other jurisdictions. When you look at the number of agreements that are made throughout the province of Ontario, and you realize that over 98 per cent of those agreements are reached without a strike, without a lockout, the labour peace uh, that's been enjoyed by this province is as a result of the relationships that we've been able to build with both labour and with employers in the province of Ontario. We have a record, sir, that's second to none. I think when it comes to labour peace, we work with both sides. Both sides view this government as a government that values the relationship that it has with either. We plan to continue. We know that the best agreement you could possibly Answer. reach is one that's reached between the parties. We attempt to facilitate that. We've got the best mediators in the country. We reach the best agreements in the country. 
Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. I'm not sure about labour peace, uh, uh, Speaker, because I'm receiving email on a daily basis from Nipissing University students and parents. They're concerned the students may not be able to complete their semesters. Meanwhile, workers, friends and families are out protesting the hospital cuts every single week. And at Ontario Northland, Unifor's national president became involved and laid this lockout firmly at the feet of the Premier and the Liberal government, wow. despite the fact that, as the Deputy Premier said, the government has run out of money, they found billions to waste on gas plants, e-health, orange and smart meter scandals. My question is, how long will the minister let these disruptions drag out? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the supplementary. As I said, we're proud of the record here in the province of Ontario. 98% of the labour contracts in Ontario are settled without any disruption at all. The, uh, when we made the decision to keep four of the five business lines of the ONTC Commission in public hands, we made it very, very clear, I think, to everybody in Ontario that labour is a critical component of transforming the ONTs for long-term relationships because we need to support that case of public ownership. Speaker, agreements have been reached with other, with other bargaining agents as we've moved through that process. The ONTC management has tabled final offers with Unifor. I know that Unifor, which is a very highly valued uh, integral part of the, uh, of the, uh, the labour community in the province, is taking a look at those, is working hard. I suspect, Speaker, that if both groups work together at the table, an agreement can Thank be you. reached in both cases. New question. The member from Tomiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, management of the Ontario Northland Transportation locked out workers at its repair shops across the North Cochrane and uh, North Bay, a move overturned by the, Cana by the Canada Industrial Relations Board. Now they're locked out again after negotiators for the company, or the government, basically, walked away from the table. First the government ends train service, then they cut back bus routes, now they're strong-arming workers. Northerners are getting, getting the feeling that they fought to take ONTC, to force the government to take them off the auction block, and now it seems they're putting them on the chopping block. Is this government actually determined to destroy public transportation in Northern Ontario? I appreciate having the opportunity, Speaker. The Minister of Labour just spoke uh, very well to the, to the same issue. The fact is, uh, uh, Speaker, when, the, when our government, under Premier Wynne's leadership, made the uh, decision after much uh, uh, consultation with Northerners to keep uh, four of the five business lines of the ONTC in public hands, that was a proud moment, and it continues to be a proud moment. And we are committed to transforming the ONTC to ensure sustainable employment, continued economic growth and a strong pro transportation network in northeastern Ontario. But it is also important, and we've made it clear, that a critical component of transforming the ONTC for long-term sustainability certainly is supporting a continued case for public growth. We need to have the labour agreements in place, and there have been some that have put in place. Answer. I am optimistic that, as we respect the collective bargaining process, that indeed will continue to carry forward, and that hopefully they'll Thank be you. back to the table and agreements will be put in place. To Subtle reminder, when I stand, you sit. you got to look over this way every now and then. The government house leader on a point of order. Be a point of order, but I want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome uh, Tony Ionucci, Kevin Hawaii, and Nikki Holland, who are members of Carpenters Union and visiting Queen's Park today. Thank you. Thank you. A member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I would like to introduce Mr. Bill Ferguson in our, um, uh, in our gallery. Thank you. No further, there are no deferred votes. This house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.